really fun to work with outstanding students um, and they're going to present their projects. For each, we're going to have an inter their introduction, presentation, and questions. Uh, Maddie has uh, agreed to go first, and then we'll have Leah also do introduction, presentation, and questions. So um, Maddie already has her, her title up there. Let me introduce her. She's a recent graduate from the College of Natural Resources. She um, just completed a Master's of Science degree program at the University of Idaho. She's currently employed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Caldwell, Idaho. She's just moved there. Um, and, we're, and we're excited for what she will learn and contribute. The work she'll be presenting tonight was developed while she was working for Thorn Creek Native Seed Farm during uh, doing Palouse Remnant uh, restoration on Paradise Ridge uh, in Moscow, Idaho. So she has a wealth of experience to share with us. And um, she focused on um, integrated weed management. As she, so with that, Maddie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, let me know if you guys have any trouble hearing me or anything. Um, yeah, as Penny said, I got my master's at the U of I. I also got my undergrad there. <laughs> I graduated from Moscow High. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on the Palouse. Ava was my advisor for my master's and I have had a lot of support and yeah, from strong women on the Palouse. So I'm very grateful for that. <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in to presenting this. I'm pointing at a different screen. I'm really bad at that. I'm going to point at the screen and you guys can't see what I'm pointing at. I'll try to use my cursor. So what I'm presenting today <clears throat> is a book I have created that is a template for land managers to create an integrated weed management plan for the Palouse Prairie plant community that they manage. So I'm just going to jump right in. This is a screenshot of the table of contents page and I'm not gonna read it to you, but I'll it's just kind of a little, yeah. What today is gonna be is like a teaser trailer of what the document is and trying to convince you to use it. <laughs> so this document currently is 31 pages long with another 18 pages of like worksheets and how to's and stuff like that. Um, it's not published yet. We're still working on that. Um, the purpose of the document is to help land stewards create a formal weed management plan. The, you guys have had a lot of presentations about Palouse Prairie and the number one threat to Palouse remnants themselves are invasive plants. And so that's what this is all targeted, targeted at is helping create healthier plant communities. The intended user would be managers of these native plant communities and the plant communities themselves aren't necessarily only Palouse Prairie remnants, but it could also include pine savannas, which Penny did a presentation on pine savannas and also reconstructed prairies. So that would be what was once an ag field and then was reseeded and replanted back into native plants. And then also you could go down, it could apply to the canyon grasslands down like the Snake River Canyon and stuff like that. But it's basically bunch grass dominated systems. Um, and that's just a picture of the kind of the mosaic, the landscape mosaic that is the Palouse Prairie. <clears throat> I've said integrated weed management a couple times and I'll define what that is. So IWM was first developed in ag systems and it's basically a management plan that has you use as many tools as possible in order to control your weeds while making the system more resistant to more invasion. And so rather than just spray, 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 you try to use as many tools as you have in your hands. This is a picture of a hedge trimmer for cutting the seed heads off of things. Um, and while you're controlling these weeds, you're also trying to improve the ecological function of the system so that it is healthier. And those two measures of health that I really like to talk about are resiliency and resistancy. So resistance would be a system's ability to 
ward off further invasion. And then resiliency is kind of a plant communities or a system's ability to bounce back after disturbance. So there's a lot of IWM models out there. And for this document, I've adopted a six step cyclical process <clears throat> kind of outlined in that lower right hand corner. And that's what we're gonna jump into talking about. The first step, which is unfortunately the most intimidating is mapping your land. <laughs> And I, a lot of people, so at the Leitah Soil and Water Conservation District, when people go to them for help with managing their Palouse remnants, a lot of times they want to know, where do I start? And I really think getting a broad picture of your land, mapping it, and then breaking it up into smaller management units makes it easier to attack this intimidating task. And so in this section of the book, I recommend you clump it up into smaller units that are similar plant communities. Most likely they would be um, experiencing similar invasion processes, similar weeds would be existing there. Also including on this map would be trails or access routes, things like that. And in the document, in that lower right-hand corner, I have a to-do section, which I have at the bottom of every section in the book. And in this section, I've included a how-to using Google Earth Pro, which is a free software for mapping online, but that's really pretty intimidating. And so a hand-drawn map on an aerial image is just as effective. So really, I. I know this is scary software mapping, but it doesn't have to be. It can be pretty approachable, simple, and you'll be building on this map later with some weed locations. <clears throat> Which is the next step. So knowing the weeds that are on your land is of course important. <laughs> and we on the Palouse are super lucky to have two land grant universities. And those universities offer a lot of support. And both the University of Idaho and WSU offer specimen identification for weeds. So that's through the Erickson Weed Lab and then WSU Extension um, Department of Crop and Soil Sciences. You can either send in a scan of the weed and they can try to identify it or an actual specimen you can send it in. And I've used it before. They're really helpful and it's great. And then also, plant books. You can't have enough plant books. And <clears throat> these four are examples of free books online that you can also purchase <laughs> um, print copies of. But I'd really like to highlight that Forbes Seedling Guide, which was created by two Native Plant Society members. <laughs> but what's so cool about that book is that it's not just weeds. It has a lot of native plants in it. But it helps, it provides identification techniques for plants before they're flowering, which is really important. And it also in it, if the plant is not native, it has a section for priority for control, which is based on local knowledge of how invasive that plant can possibly be. And then in the how, in the to-do section is to kind of begin that list of where the, of the plants and then marking their location on that map you had. So there's a lot more on that worksheet and you'll build upon it in these subsequent sections. So that's for this, getting to know the weeds on your land and it's gonna change every year, hopefully get shorter, but we never know. <laughs> and then the next section of the book is exploring the strategies and methods for controlling weeds in Weed control, there's generally four categories, and the first being mechanical. Mechanical control is the physical removal of a, of a part or whole plant. And central to IWM is identifying the vulnerability of that plant in its life, site, in its life stage. So all plants go through the cyclical process, whether they're annuals or perennials. And mechanical control, just like all the rest of them, should be targeted at when that plant is vulnerable to certain method. And so here's Meg cutting yellow star thistle by hand and she's doing it 
when it's tall enough to see, so it's effective, it's efficient for you walking around, but it's also before the seeds are viable and can fall off and you would be spreading and making the problem worse. Um, and then moving on to chemical, this is a picture of Ransom using a weed wand. So it's a really specific application of the chemical on the ground. And it's also timed. You can see that a lot of the plants are brown, so they're not necessarily susceptible to taking up chemical. So with chemical control, using a selective herbicide and your timing and the rate, these are all really important to minimizing the negative effects of your control. Cultural control, I think, is my the most exciting control method that I really like to talk about. And it's basically changing your habits in order to reduce the invasion processes on a landscape. And so this is a picture of us scouting on Paradise Ridge. <clears throat> and you might not think that scouting, you're actually doing anything, but you're getting to know the land. You're getting to know when a plant is flowering, when it's in when it's germinating, that kind of thing. And so scouting is really important to getting to know where things occur and when they're doing what they're doing. And then that bottom picture is of seeds. Because if you take something out, you've got to put something back in. If you just leave a bare area, it's probably just going to get reinvaded by Ventanata. So that's also part of cultural control. <clears throat> and then the last one, which I don't really talk about much, is biological. But this is a picture of a chrysalina beetle which is the biocontrol that we've had in North America for, I might get this wrong, but like 60 years. And it's for St. John's wort. And also in this area, the Nez Perce Biocontrol Center has a lot of biocontrol agents and you can contact them. And they, I'm pretty sure they give small releases out for free. So that's a really amazing resource. Here is, uh, <clears throat> when I worked on Paradise Ridge, I created this calendar because we control <laughs> can be very daunting and I kind of wanted to know next year what was I going to do. So this is based on two summers of doing restoration up on Paradise Ridge. And what I really want to point out is like, so if we look at hound's tongue here, I'm scouting for it in May. And then in June, when I can see the plant <clears throat> and the rosettes are large enough, I start spot spraying for it. But by July, those second year plants, which are now producing flowers, I can no longer really spray for. And so now I've changed my method and I'm hand clipping off those flower heads before they produce viable seeds. And then in September, those what germinated that year will be these small rosettes that you can then start spot spraying again. So I just, this the point of this is just to show that your control method changes throughout the year based on when that plant is vulnerable to a specific control method. <clears throat> and so this next section is about setting goals and priorities. So this is kind of like a step back, like think about the big picture. What do you want to have happen on your land? And so I've separated out goals as like big picture statements. Um, what do you want to do on your land? What do you want to see happen? What is the point of all your work? And then priorities would be more specific to within each season, how are you going to spend your time? How are you gonna spend your money? That kind of stuff. And so I just kind of included some examples on here for goals. One could be like providing pollinating plants throughout all the different growing seasons, you know, early season flowers, late season flowers. And then priorities could be, if you have an area that doesn't really have very many weeds, try to make sure that it doesn't get infected by all these non-native plants. And then also another important priority, I think, is making sure those high traffic areas aren't a vector for further spread. Those are just examples of priorities. <clears throat> and now it's kind of time to get to work. <laughs> and uh, one of the most important things about doing a task like this is to um, be thoughtful about it. And at the end of the day, after you've been walking around pulling weeds or doing whatever all day, the last thing you want to do is paperwork. But keeping careful records is incredibly important to improving all the hard work you've done year after year. And so 
this is a worksheet that I've included. And when I worked at JC's the first year, I really didn't want to do this and I hated it every afternoon. But then that winter in December, when I was going over my records, I like, I got more excited about next year. I had plans and I was looking forward to do it. I was, oh yeah, I remember when I did this with the tall oak grass and it didn't work. I'm gonna try this next year. And so this is a really important part of any restoration project is keeping careful records. <clears throat> and then the last step is at the end of the season when the snow is on the ground and you've got time is to look back over what you did and what was efficient, what was effective. Like one summer I weed whacked red sorrel for weeks and weeks and weeks and it just kept sending up more flowers. And I'm pretty sure that red sorrel produced more seed because of my weed whacking than if I would have done nothing. And so, and I kept records of it. And so it's really important to was, did you cause more harm? I'm pretty sure I did that summer. So looking back over what you've done, changing things, are your efforts actually moving you towards your goal? Or are you just kind of spinning your tires? And then also talking to people about this. There is a lot of people probably in this meeting today that do a lot of really cool stuff with their plant communities. And I think it's really important to reach out to other people, bounce ideas off of others, see what they're doing, share what you're doing. And so, yeah, I think that this revision, this review and revise is pretty important. Obviously it's not gonna take as much time as the first time you ran through it, but that's an important part. And then I guess for the last bit, I just really wanna thank everyone that I worked with at Thoring Creek Native Seed Farm. As I said, weed control doesn't happen in a void and everyone I worked with there was incredibly smart and they really helped me in the formation of this document and I'm eternally grateful. I still text them questions, so. But that's it for me, I tried to keep it short. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Maddie. This looks like a really useful tool. We have a few questions um, <laughs> and I hope others in the audience will submit more questions. So um, first, is there a biological control for rush skeleton weed? That was Yes. Yes. And I'm pretty sure I saw that Dr. Prather was in the meeting and he'll know more about this, but there are, and it's on the Palouse. And I've seen it and it's, there's a couple, I'm going to get this wrong. I know there's at least two that we have in the area and I've seen one or two of them. And a lot of, most of the land that I've seen it on, the people haven't released it there. It's just spread in the wind. It's a tiny, tiny little, I don't even know what it is. I don't want to guess. So, <laughs> but yes, there is a biological for skeleton weed. When will the book be published? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, Ava and I are currently working with the University of Idaho College of Ag Extension Office, and we're in discussions with them about publishing the document. So, and it looks like right now, the document will potentially be published in a digital format that someone could download and print themselves, but that it would live online, so. Okay. So Tim Prather, thank you, Tim, said that it's a um, rust skeleton weed biocontrol as a mite, a midge, and a rust. Three. There's a comment from Pam Brunsfeld. I just want to commend the renowned master of keying and systematic botany, Maddie Schmidt, for becoming a plant nerd. <laughs> yeah, she was my botany teacher. <laughs> I have a, um, why would, uh, two questions, why would, uh, one need weed control and an integrated weed management plan. What's the value to a landowner to going through the work you've just talked about? And then um, 
Do you think it will be successful? Um, I guess I think that by formalizing, by writing down what you want to do on your land as far as controlling your weeds, I think it'll, I think keeping records makes you more successful because like, what time did I do this last year? Oh yeah, I can look back in my records and see when I started going out and spraying for tallow grass. Um, and then the success question I think is pretty tough because I think if your goal is to have no weeds, you are not going to be successful. That's not possible. But I think if your goal is to have more biodiversity or more pollinators or more something. I think you can be successful, but I think weed free is not. <laughs> so, <gonna happen. laughs> but maybe some managing weeds with, to reduce their, so they don't dominate. Yes. Yes. I think that we can move stuff towards healthier. And I think we do have some healthy blues remnants, but I think that they do need management and I'm very in awe of the, some of the women and men <laughs> that are <laughs> managing Palouse remnants. They're doing amazing work, <laughs> okay. hard work. So I very much appreciate them. Um, okay. We have another question from Steve Bunting who said, ask Maddie where to get the latest information on herbicides since this can change so quickly. Um, well, obviously the label, <laughs> but then again, I'm going to push Dr. Prather. He's, uh, he's actually certified to provide recommendations for chemicals, which I am not. And most people are not, but then I do happen to have next to me, this amazing book. Um, this book it's called weed control in natural areas. And it's a, University of California Extension book. And in it, it has a whole bunch of different um, chemical rates, timing. It also has mechanical control. It has a whole bunch of recommendations for weed control in natural areas. And I use that book all the time. It's in my office here. <laughs> okay, and Tim uh, Prather uh, suggested the Pacific Northwest Weed Management Handbook as a good source. Um, Tim, where would that be available? You could just uh, unmute and speak to it if you'd like. <laughs> it's it's available online. If you just put in Google PNW Weed Management Handbook. Okay, great. And for both of those, are they um, relevant locally? You said yours, the one you said is California, Maddie. It was created in California, but it has a lot of information for all Western states. Um, I think, yeah, timing is important for when plants are going through those different life cycles. So they're gonna be different everywhere. But um, yeah, I think it's appropriate here. I use it here. It, it, it is useful here. Uh, there were a, a lot of authors. It was published out of University of California. That's who the uh, editor and main author was, but a lot of us contributed and it was designed for the Western US. Okay. And then as you say, Maddie, the, uh, seeing what works on each person's ground really um, is important. Yeah, and I think that's something that um, people that have been actively managing their Palouse plant community for a while, they come to realize is that you just gotta talk to your community. You've gotta talk to other people that are doing it. Other people have different techniques and just talk to people like with everything. <laughs> but talk to people and then um, be observant about what is working and what's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have time for one more question. So I think we're all really excited for this uh, publication, uh, Maddie. That was a comment from uh, Brenda Earhart and um, echoed by several other people um, on 
who are listening today. So thank you so much. We um, are eager to hear, uh, hear more. Um, one more question. What are the risks of integrated weed management? Can you do more harm than good? Always, <laughs> you can always do harm. It's easy to be careless. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, but I think the risk of doing nothing is really high. I think that if you are not watching how the community is changing over time, that in itself is harmful. So yeah, I definitely think you can Chemicals are scary and it's not always easy to read the label that carefully. You can read it a billion times and still not do it right. But I think that being thoughtful, doing small test strips, asking for advice from Dr. Prather, <laughs> that kind of thing will increase your chance of success. So, okay. Patty, thank you so very much. Would you please put your email in the chat if you are willing to have follow-up questions? Sure. And um, just thank you so uh, very much. We are proud of you uh, for what you've accomplished and this will be a tremendous uh, useful tool. So with that, we're going to turn to Leah. So, um, I'll give a brief uh, introduction while she's getting set up, sharing her screen. So, um, and unmuting herself. So Leah uh, Driesman uh, received a mini grant from the White Pine chapter of the Idaho Native Plant Society. Um, so just a side note that the plant sale that's coming up funds such grants uh, to students and for other different, all different kinds of conservation projects as well. So Leah received a mini grant from us uh, and she used it to research the intentions, objectives and practices of homeowners who are wisecaping their yard. So what, as she'll explain what wisecaping is in a moment. The project also looked at greater ecological benefits of wisecaping gardens, including if native Palouse prairie plants are used and which are most successful and if wisecape gardens provide habitat to native pollinators. This research project is her senior thesis. She is just completing now an undergraduate degree in ecology and conservation biology at the University of Idaho. She'll be graduating in May. So with that, uh, Leah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Can you see me okay? Uh, can you speak up or be closer to your computer? Yes, <laughs> sorry, I don't know why I'm having problems with my microphone, but let me know if you can't hear me. Okay, that's much better. And can you see my screen okay? Uh, yes. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so again, my name is Leah Driesman and this is my presentation on wisecaping with native plants on the Palouse. Um, so this is my senior thesis and for this my faculty advisor was Ava Strand. So I thought I'd start by giving you a little bit of background on me and then kind of how this project came about. Um, so. I grew up in Mothago, um, and I was raised by parents who were really interested in the natural world and the environment. And so in high school, I got really involved in the Environmental Action Club. Um, and through that, I really started learning about water conservation issues on the place. And I loved it because I felt like it could actually make a difference because it's such a local issue. Um, um, and so around that time, I, I first heard of this concept of wisecaping. Um, and then while I was in high school, my parents also started a wisecape in our front yard. Um, so by observing what they were doing um, and the plants they were using and all these pollinators buzzing around in their, wise, um, their landscape, I'm like, this kind of led to like these research questions um, that I wanted to try to explore in my research project. So my research objectives were to learn- Leah, you're gonna need to speak up even more. People are having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay, um, I'm so Thank sorry, you. I don't know why. Um, so my research ob objectives were to learn about the practices and intentions of homeowners who buy um, And then I also wanted to learn if there are greater ecological benefits from wisecapes. Um, so is habitat for pollinators being provided and are loose prairie plants being used? Before I get too far, I wanted to define 
a few things for you. So the first, of course, is Yscape, um, which is a term that some of you may not have heard. Um, basically, it's a concept that promotes water efficient landscaping on the Palouse. Um, this is very similar to Xeriscape, if you've heard of that. Um, but it expands on that concept to include, like, um, be specific for the Palouse region. Um, this is something that the city of Moscow established, and Nicole Baker is really instrumental in this. Um, I'm kind of using this definition loosely because, A, I think it's a very loose definition to start with. Um, but then also, um, even if people aren't doing exactly flyscaping and they're doing landscaping that's um, promoting water efficiency, they have really in interesting experience and things that we can learn from. Um, if you want to know more about this, the city of Moscow has this really cool Yscape guidebook um, that you can find at their website. The other thing I wanted to find was native plants, because um, this is a really broad term um, and a question that I've asked myself a lot, how I was defining native plants during this project. But I've kind of landed on plants that are indigenous to the Palouse region. Um, um, but I did take into account that like ornamentals that are not even native to um, North America are very different than plants that are um, native to Idaho, but maybe not this region. Um, and then the one last thing I want to add is that even though this is about the Palouse region, um, a lot of these concepts and things I talk about are probably very applicable to other areas. Um, just maybe different plants. So for, to do this research, um, I was able to get 12 participants who had to escape their yard. Um, and I found them through um, word of mouth and people that I knew, um, as well as um, um, the um, White Pine chapter sent out an email advertising um, and looking for people for me, which is really helpful. Um, the other thing I want to add is that I started this project right when COVID started to pick up. Um, and so it made it complicated to identify people and kind of complicated the whole process. Um, but I still got a really good research project that was just different than I originally pictured. Um, so to answer my questions, I um, had an interview. Um, and this was 15 open-ended questions and that was approved by the Institutional Review Board of U of I. Um, and that kind of touched on my first objective. And then for my second objective, I first had a pollinator survey. Um, this was a little bit smaller with only six Yscapes, um, but it involved me walking around for 15 minutes and recording um, and counting the number of pollinators I observed and what group they were, kind of big groups that they were in, like honeybees, bumblebees, other native bees and butterflies and things. The last part of my research um, was a plant survey um, of the Yscapes. Um, and there's a kind of a couple different ways that I got this. Um, the first was some people had plant lists, which was really cool, and they provided me with that, so didn't have to do too much for the land. Um, then I also walked through several Yscapes with the homeowners, and they talked me through different plants, and I created a list that way. And then for a couple, I walked through myself by myself um, with guidebooks and was able to identify as many plants as I could. But there were some plants that I, I didn't, I missed, um, especially ornamentals, which were really hard to identify. So um, getting to my results and what I found, um, I had a lot of information, a lot of information. So I've narrowed it down a little bit um, to hopefully share what you guys might find the most interesting. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, by no means am I an expert. I actually haven't created a Yscape, um, but I can report what other people have done and what they have found successful. So for the interview, um, here's just a little bit of an outline of the different things I am going to talk about. So the first is I asked people what their goals and motivations for creating a Yscape was. Um, and I got a lot of different answers. Um, and most people answered multiple, multiple things. So um, these graphs show like the percent of people who answered this question. Um, we we'll gave these answers. Um, so the biggest reason um, or goals and motivation was um, about 50% people said to conserve water. And then about 50% of people also said they wanted to bring sort of life to their yard. Um, so I think, I think by this, they mean like um, grass is kind of boring and there's not a lot happening with all the different um, plants. You can see lots of different things. Other really important goals and motivations included um, have aesthetics, so things looking nice, um, providing pollinator habitat, using native plants, wanting bloom heterogeneity. Um, and then there's also some kind of cool ones um, <laughs> or interesting reasons like needing a new project um, or wanting to have edible foods that they could use but still have um, low water usage. 
Um, so talking of water of usage, I have, of course, had to ask how much water people were using because this is about, um, landscaping is about water conservation. And there was a really big range uh, from people using like no water from the aquifers um, to using some almost every day. Um, kind of the two extremes of this um, and how they did this is um, one person um, collected rainwater, um, was able to go around and hand water anything they needed from that. So they didn't ever have to like, turn on the tap. Um, but then another person had integrated a vegetable garden into their wildscape. And of course, those plants um, aren't as drought resistant as um, say native plants. And so they had to do a bit more watering. Um, but there was like some main reasons. Um, first was um, when people are establishing transplants, um, that first season they really need to be watered. And then also many people mentioned that in the heat of summer, so like July and August, they would put a little bit of water on their plants just to help them out a little bit. Um, so I also asked about how much maintenance people were doing and what kind of maintenance they were doing. And of course there was more answers than this. These were the big ones and there seems to be a lot of really shared, shared maintenance. Um, but 83% of people said that they did weeding, um, which makes sense because it's a garden. Um, and then 83% also said that they were adding or relocating plants. So there's People are, um, most people are still changing it, even though um, some of them have been established for a really long time. Um, another big um, thing people are doing was pruning, pruning and deadheading plants in the fall or spring. Um, many people were mulching their landscape, um, so putting on bark so that um, to help, help hold moisture. Um, but this wasn't an every year thing. This was like every few years or, you know, they've only done it like once or twice since they first established. And then about a third of people were still expanding the area of their wildscape. Um, so they started with a smaller area of grass and they continued to um, um, remove grass and grow their thing. Um, one really interesting thing was that dairy, is that several people mentioned to me that they didn't mind spending time working in their wildscape compared to like mowing the, mowing the lawn. They hated doing that, but they, they had fun and they enjoyed going out and making um, to maintaining, which I thought was a, a positive, um, positive thing. So next I wanted to talk about where people were getting their plants. Um, and this is one thing that you guys might find really interesting is that every single person I talked to got plants from the White Pine Chapter Idaho Native um, Plant Society plant sale. So with your plant sale coming up really soon, um, it's good motivation to keep them going. Um, about 80% of people also um, shared cuttings with neighbors and their friends. Um, and then the other main places that people bought plants were from the Fillers Ridge Farm and then the Arboretum plant sale. Um, but there's a lot of others. I think there was 19 different sources people mentioned to me in total. So there's a lot of different places out there that people are finding plants. So when people are getting plants, I wanted to know what kind of traits they were looking for. Um, so about 50% of people said they specifically looked for native plants um, and then about 42 said they're looking for drought resistant and things that look nice. Um, size was also really important, not being too weedy, um, attracting pollinators, like having good sun shade tolerance, the bloom time, and if they'd like match the location were also really important. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting about this is that only 42% of people said they were looking for drought resistant plants specifically. Um, and there's like two reasons why I think this might be. Um, the first is like the context of the interview. Um, because we were talking about a wisecape, they might have just assumed that was, you know, not come to your mind when you're being asked about it um, because we're already talking about drought resistant plants. Um, but the other thing is though that 50% of people said they were looking for native plants. Um, and because native plants, you know, um, are used to this climate that not be, you know, that's a separate category in a way. So that's something I found really interesting. Um, and the last thing for the interview questions that I really wanted to talk about was what people define, how people define like successful and unsuccessful plants and traits. And some of these are really straightforward and make a lot of sense. Um, the aesthetics, if they looked nice, they were a successful plant, or if they didn't look nice, they were a less successful plant. Um, also, if they grew well, they were successful. If they didn't grow well, or if they died, they were an unsuccessful plant. Um, the other thing that a lot of people mentioned was how much maintenance they required and wanting plants that were low maintenance. And this was kind of where there was a divide. Um, 
in the, the plant traits that kind of led to a low maintenance. Um, but so for some people who had a Yscape that was a bit more like a plant community with plants kind of growing um, wherever they want, they really liked plants that were regenerative, um, put off seedlings. Um, so they did the work for them. They didn't have to go out and plant new things. Um, but for some homeowners, they want a little bit more of a traditional garden with things having a little bit more of their own place. Um, they didn't want those non-regenerative plants. I mean, they didn't want those regenerative plants and they wanted non-regenerative plants. Um, because those seedlings was then something they'd have to weed out if it wasn't where they wanted it. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the pollinator survey I did. I'm gonna talk about a few of the limitations from this, um, the pollinators that I observed and then some trends. So there's a couple limitations. Um, the first is that I did have a really small sample size. So um, like with only six, um, and so some of the things I've mentioned, I can talk about trends, but um, there needs to be more research on this to make any um, definite conclusions. Um, and things that kind of um, affected what I saw was um, the time of summer. So I interviewed people from May to August and there's gonna be very different plants and very different pollinators at those different times. Um, the time of day was also important. Um, I worked, most of the people who I was talking to also worked. And so we often ended up meeting in the evening. Um, but pollinators like the middle of the afternoon when it's nice and hot and sunny. And so I probably saw po fewer pollinators um, when I wasn't able to go at that time. Um, there are sometimes also uncountable numbers. Um, and this goldenrod is a really good example of this. Um, I think there's nine pollinators on this one inflorescence. Um, and there's a, um, a couple meter like area of this goldenrod. Um, and there was just buzzing with so many pollinators that I couldn't, I, there's no way I could count it. Um, so I made an educated guess, um, but it was really cool to see. Um, and the other thing is I probably did some recounting because I was like removing the pollinators from the um, area. They were just, I was just counting them. They probably, some of them probably got recounted. So this is the abundance of the different um, groups I saw. And as you can see, there's honeybees, bumblebees, um, other bees, and these are mostly other native bees. Um, I found it really hard to identify them out into like smaller groups than, than the native bees. So I, I left it at that. Um, then flies, wasps, butterflies, dragonflies, um, and hornets. And of course you can see that the native bees were the, by far the biggest group. Um, and wasps and honeybees and bumblebees were also pretty popular. Um, so I can talk to some of the different trends I saw. So 68% of the observed native bees, so the 68% of all the pollinators I observed were native bees, and this includes the other bees and the, um, the bumblebees. Um, one really interesting thing I saw was that at two of my sites, um, they had more non-native plants and ornamentals um, than, than native plants. And 51% of my observed honeybees out of 60 um, came from those two sites. So it could be that the plants you're using does affect the kind of pollinators um, coming to the site. Um, and then I was also able to look at a Yscape and then a traditional yard um, on the same day. They had their front yard was Yscape and the backyard is um, like traditional, um, of a traditional garden and some vegetable garden. Um, and I saw double the number of bees in the Yscape than I did in the back. Um, which kind of suggests that these Yscapes really do provide more habitat than other types. But of course, more, more research with a bigger sample size would be needed. Um, and so the last thing I want to talk about is my um, plant survey. Um, so I identified 302 species and genera, and of that identified 94 as Bruce Prairie natives. And then additional seven um, species were found to be in the surrounding areas. So like up on Plus, um, uh, Moscow Mountain or something. So in the area, but not exactly Plus Prairie, but still very native. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that it was hard to find like a good plant list to compare of like what a Plus Prairie natives are. And so I drew from a bunch of different resources. And Brenda Earhart was so um, helpful in helping me come up with defining what, like finding which plants I had were these very natives, but I probably missed some, <laughs> keep that in mind. And here's a list of the whole, all of them. So you can see how many I have. 
Um, so lastly, um, I think this might be helpful as you go into your plant cell. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through some of the popular plants um, that people had, um, especially the natives. Um, so you can make choices about maybe wanting to use them or not. Um, so first I'm gonna start with some of the ones that were a little bit less regenerative, um, if that's something that you're interested in. So prairie smoke was really popular. Um, nine people had it in their yards. Um, and then Jessica's and Western mountain asters were also really popular. Um, I had a hard time differentiating them, so I've lumped them together. <laughs> so at least nine people had um, one or the other of these. Um, one thing is that I know that the Jessica aster gets really big, and for some people it's too big for their wise scape. Um, but I know the Western mountain aster is a little bit smaller, so maybe that'd be good. Um, these are also late blooming, um, which is really good for pollinators who often are struggle to find those resources later in the season. Um, another really popular plant was um, the sticky purple geranium with seven um, people having them in the yards. Pensamins were super popular um, and I saw so many different species. I um, can't remember how many right now, but there was, there was a lot. Um, and most people had them. Um, they're really good for pollinators. Um, so people, that's one reason people like them. Um, and I know here are four that are native to the Palouse Prairie region. Um, if you're looking for specifically native, but there's also a lot in the surrounding areas, um, not very, you know, not blue spray, but very close here that are also um, found. Buckwheat is also very popular, six people have them. Um, and I observed seven different varieties. Um, there are two that are native that I know of that I had, um, the parsnip flower and then the matted um, buckwheat. Um, round leaf alum root was pretty popular. Um, I was told it's really easy to grow um, and four people had that. Blanket flower was also very popular. Um, six people, so half, half the people had this in their yard. Um, so now I'm gonna move into some of the plants that are a little bit more regenerative. So if you're not wanting that more of a community, these might be um, not plants for you, but they're also very, they're still very nice. Um, so common yarrow, um, seven people had this. Um, you've probably seen this around. Um, one thing I want to mention, there is a lot of ornamental varieties. Um, so if you're not wanting um, native, non-native, like walk, watch out for those. Um, golden rods were also very popular. Um, seven different people had them um, in their wise scape. And we have two species here, um, the Canada and Missouri. Um, another thing is that these are the, these late, these are late blooming um, in the season. And so they provide um, habitat for the pollinators in the, in the fall. Um, and this is the one that had all those pollinators that I couldn't Counts. Um, Lewis flax was also really popular with five people having it. Um, the facilia were also really popular um, with four, four people had them. Um, there is a native um, very leaf facilia, um, but I saw some other varieties that weren't the blue spray native. Um, and they're really good for pollinators um, because they have all these inflorescence. Um, but they, they did seem really good at spreading and taking over if you're not careful. <laughs> There's of course a bunch of grasses on the Palouse Prairie and not a lot of people um, often think of using grasses, like um, these big grasses in their landscape, but um, two of the really popular ones were the blue bunch wheat grass with five people having them. And then um, six people had Idaho fescue. I also wanted to mention the creeping Oregon grape. Um, only three people had this, um, but I know that it's pretty good for shade like more shaded areas. Um, and a lot of people had the tall Oregon grape, which is the non-native one, um, but they really liked it because it added something a little different <laughs> into their, their yard. Um, so I also wanted to mention some non-native plants that people really liked because there, there were some that were mentioned to me. Um, and one of those is, is the sedum family. Um, there is a native, um, I'm not sure if I saw it because I'm not good enough at my <laughs> plant ID. Um, but nine people had some sort of sedum in their yard because um, it just so, it really likes those drought um, conditions or those low water conditions. Another really popular one was lavender. Um, nine people had this and it's really for pollinators why they like it. And then other mints, um, lavender's mint. So other mints like salvia and catmint were also really recommended for those pollinators. 
And the last plant I wanted to mention is non-native, but it's Jupiter's beard. <laughs> um, and people really like it for their pollinators, but um, I was told that swallowtails, butterflies really like it. So if you're wanting to bring not just bees, but also butterflies, this might be a good plant. Okay, so um, after all that kind of conclusions from my research. Um, so there's a lot of really diverse intentions, motivations and practices that people have, um, but as well as some really common ground. Um, and a lot of things that a lot of people have in common. Um, it appears that these whitescapes provide habitat for pollinators, um, but more, more research would be needed <laughs> to actually show that. Um, and then native blue spray plants are being used um, in their whitescapes, which is really exciting. Um, so I just wanted to put the slide up um, and say thank you to everybody on it because without without these people and these groups, I would not have been able to get this research um, done. Um, and I'm really excited. So thank you so much. Um, and then, yeah, is there, if anybody has questions, um, and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see people's faces. Yeah. Go. Thank you so much, Leah. Uh, that's that's wonderful that you were doing this for your senior thesis and your undergraduates. So if anybody has questions, please unmute yourself. I think there's few enough people that you can unmute yourself or you can type into the chat if you have questions for Leah. I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. So I can see that. Yeah, you, yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. That's fine. Then you can see people and how they're asking you questions. That's really good. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I was asked, what were some of the other pollinators you observed? <laughs> and that's a really good question. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of variety and I'm, I can identify some of them. So there was definitely leaf cutter bees, um, mason bees, um, a lot of sweat bees, but I'm also very good at identifying sweat bees. Um, um, so th those were the, the three big groups of pollinators I saw. Yeah, other question. What kind of what kind of research question would you um, approach next, Leah, if you had if you had more time or if you were continuing your senior thesis? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the part that I didn't get expand on as much was the pollinator aspect. Um, I think I would want to ask like what plants, um, like if native plants um, result in more like native bees, um, pollinators, um, and if those non-native plants really result in more. Like honeybees and non-native bees, because I saw those little trends and I thought that was really interesting. Um, we're also comparing like the whitescapes to more non-traditional, but more, more traditional gardens, like um, vegetable gardens and things, would be really interesting. Yeah, it seems like that would be a great question. I, I mean, that's something that really came out of your research that the native bees were more attracted to or seem to be occur more often mm -hmm. in native species or the white scape garden compared yeah. to these and and yeah that would be an interesting question mm -hmm. to contribute it seems like your research kind of indicated that but but it was a small sample size and you would need to look at it more yeah exactly so will your work be be public or how can how will you summarize this information and make it available to others Oh, yeah. Um, so I am <laughs> writing like a final report right now. And if anybody would like that, um, you can feel free to email me. That'll have like my plant list and where people got, plant, um, where they got their plants and all that information in it. Um, and then I'm also putting together like a little um, brochure that has assimilates some of the information that might be the most useful, um, which I, I haven't completed it yet, but I'm sure I will find a way to get that out to the public. Um, yeah. I I mean, you're just you're just finishing up your thesis. You're just in the middle of, of basically finals week here, so you're. I'm sure you have a lot of things on your plate. Yeah. Hey, okay. hey, um, can you hear me? Yes. I can. Okay. I, I put a comment in the chat, but uh, oh. I uh, 
I just wanted to tell people that Penstemon, the genus Penstemon, I have 35 species and I'm a beekeeper, and they have a unique feature called nectar replenishment. So as the nectar is consumed from that particular flower in Penstemon, it makes more, attracting more pollinators um, and also offering the pollinators obviously more food. So I just wanted to pass that along. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, that's important information. Yeah. Oh, we have another question here from Georgia Harrison. Uh, how do you think these concepts that you have been presenting here could be applied outside of the Palouse Prairie? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a, a lot of what, what like xeriscaping and like wisecaping is really about is um, like having attractive yards during those droughty months of summer um, and plants. Um, so. Um, there's a lot of regions that have very similar summers to us that have very similar, um, you know, climates. And so we have very specific plants that are native here um, that would be successful, but other areas that have different native plants um, could also do very similar things with, with their plants. Um, and be, but the, the concept of a, how much maintenance is probably very similar and, um, you know, things like that. Yeah. And the concept of, of native plants and this relationship with native plants and native pollinators is probably a universal one, but yeah. yeah. And, and here I have another question here. Uh, are more people interested in restoring Palouse Prairie or low water use? So are they more interested in the native species or the water use, do you think, from, from the, the people that you sampled? Mm. I think that's very case by case. And again, I did only interview 12 people. So, um, and I had a, a, a little bit of bias because I drew from the Idaho Native Plant Society. And so um, a lot of people I um, interviewed were really interested in those native plants and restoring native um, native um, Blues Prairie. Be and I'm not sure if that's because I was talking to people who were in this, you know, really interested in, um, or if, um, but there was a really, there was a good mix. Um, there was some people who were really interested in the water and some people were really interested in the plants and some people who wanted to combine those two, two things together. It seems like they would combine pretty well, but maybe not always. Yeah. I think the, the like their motivations, um, where they initially started, I think, um, good, good mix. Yeah. yeah. Is it another question? Is it important for pollinators to <coughs> plant a range of species that flower through the summer and those species that have longer flowering times might be better? I would say yes. Um, that's, yes. Um, and I think um, that's why I mentioned some of those plants that had that later, later bloom season, like the goldenrods and the, um, those asters, because I think um, we often have a lot of um, spring and early summer, but those later fall are often overlooked. Um, but there, there's still a lot of pollinators that that's the only time they're even out. So yeah, it's really important. Yeah, I have I have had other students look at that too and looked at this uh, the amount of pollinators available through the season. It seems like the late season is the kind of the 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 bottleneck that it's where you really need more more uh, flowering species is at the end. So like just like you said, Jessica's aster and mm -hmm. uh, maybe the goldenrod and uh, the yarrow would be good ones to have yeah, in the year because they are also either all summer long or they come on late in the season. Mm -hmm. Did you see though that Pam Run Brunsfeld um, said that in the chat that she's lost bees when she didn't have enough food early in the spring? So she's agreeing, but not uh, it's not just late. The shoulder seasons. The shoulder yeah. seasons, yeah. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. There's fewer yeah. plants that bloom then. So. I think most of us have asters and goldenrod in our yards. The real problem is the hive comes out of hibernation, basically, in spring. And if you have a hive that survives winter, they're looking for food. You have like at least 20,000 bees looking for food. And I have found spring to be the more challenging. Mm -hmm. And offer food. And that's why I encourage people to plant things like, you know, willows, the native willows, things like that. 
that have offer a lot of a nectar reward. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Are there any other plants than willows, Pam, that you could plant early? Well, there's a lot of non-natives and that's sort of where I've kind of tipped over into the non-native part because you have things like they love snowdrops, they love yeah. things like aconites. I mean, the really early things they love. And yeah. so I've sort of, I have a lot of that non-native stuff for that time of the year. Well, it seems like the Palouse does really well on those early non-natives as well. And and that's great. Yeah. Well, mountain kittentails um, is a native and early bloomer. That's that's good. A good one also is uh, amelanchier. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's starting to bloom now in a lot of the canyons and elsewhere. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you, Leah. This was really uh, fascinating. Yeah. And, and indeed, it's a good lead in uh, to the native plant sale. <laughs>